Welcome all to Off the Cuff with Namrata. Hope you all are doing well and having a wonderful weekend, I'll say. Uh, and today we will be talking about uh, Milan Foundation. It is building a movement of girl leaders. And my guest today, I can say, is a feminist. And I'm so glad to be talking to Dhirendra Pratap Singh. Uh, welcome, Dhirendra, to Off the Cuff. Uh, thank you so much, Namrata, for the invite. It's my pleasure to be on your show. My pleasure altogether. And a little bit uh, about uh, Dhirendra. He is a passionate gender equality, diversity, and inclusion advocate. He is the CEO and founder of Milan Foundation, which works with and for adolescent girls from vulnerable communities in India by creating pathways for them to be educated, healthy, and safe. Dharendra has successfully started and scaled up social impact organizations, including India Operations for Vidya Grants, a Chicago-based uh, education-focused philanthropic fund, and Azadi Inc., an impact venture that developed a female entrepreneurship network in rural India. He has served on the board of uh, community, the Youth Collective, India's largest network of grassroots organizations working on youth empowerment. Uh, he, has, uh, uh, he has been part of the Indian delegation to the South Asian Youth Summit 2017 in Afghanistan, um, an Action for India Fellow in 2019, a Gratitude Network Fellow in 2020 and Impact Engine in, uh, Incubatory in uh, 2012 and a Karam Veer Puraskar Awardee. This can go on and on. So we can see his work is very extensive and, uh, uh, you know, all, uh, you know, Thirindra, I will just start with um, what made you start uh, Milan and why? So, um, so Milan started as an idea of a of a group of youth coming together, and we were all kind of studying in Delhi University, and um, we had different experiences of uh, mm. of living and working with children in remote parts of the country. Um, yeah. mm. uh, frankly, when we started, the idea was not to start an organization. We were looking at a project, and we were 17, 18 year old kids, right? So the idea was kind of looking at a project and how can we give back. Uh, but most importantly, I think we were connecting on two things. Uh, mm. Number one um, mm. was the fact that, you know, living in India, the aspiration of the middle class is always to make a lot of money. And then you understand what is making, what what does it mean to make money? Um, and, and, you know, you, as you make money, you have a servant kind of a entire sector that supports you. So you have people kind of helping you, you know, mm. to drive around, maids, servants, Mm. Um, and I think the question of when I was working with the, the children in Uttarakhand, which is where, uh, you know, with an amazing organization called as Himalayan Gram Vikas Samiti, I was literally questioning saying, what is the future of these children? Mm. Will they grow up or are we systematically want them to grow up and serve us? Uh, mm. Because just the quality of education we are providing uh, and the social economical challenges that they kind of come from. Mm. Uh, and I think that made me question my own privilege in a in a in a way that I do I do come I to be very frank I come from a very humble background I come from a lower middle class background my dad is a soldier in the army a mother's housewife so I think it's not that I came from when I say privilege I came from money but I think privilege is also relative right so I was looking at like saying I had all this support I never had to think about a roof on my head a food on the table mm -hmm. uh, and very very supportive and encouraging parents who kind of made sure that we get the best of the education. And then there are children, you know, who mm. we don't know what the future is going to look like. Uh, mm. So we actually started with a very small education project in Sitapur in Uttar Pradesh, mm. um, which was a learning center. It slowly grew, got traction. Mm. The community came together and said, there's no school. Can we build a school together? And so actually Milan was started as a school project way back in 2007. And so the community gave us one acre of land and we slowly built a school today. Mm -hmm. And that, you know, besides all the projects that came out, but the school currently works with about 650 plus children uh, in Sitapur. Mm -hmm. uh, so it's been a very organic uh, journey. And I would say I've, we've learned and grown in the as we went along. Mm -hmm. 
I think, uh, you know, it's the first step and a small step, uh, you know, made with intent can, you know, take you this far. And um, kudos to all of you. I think you were four uh, guys who started this. Correct. <laughs> Yeah. Three guys and a girl, so four people. Okay, yeah. Four so people. they said four uh, people, yeah. Uh, uh, that's amazing. But, you know, one uh, thought that came to my mind, uh, we all are, you know, coming from a humble background. Um, I'm from a small town. I've been to certain uh, rural areas up north, and we've seen the life and how, how difficult it is for people, you know, who are just uh, living on daily wages there. But... There are only very few are very conscious about it, uh, you know, and uh, I guess uh, that's that's what I feel is missing in India. You take it, uh, you know, you get desensitized when you see so much of uh, poverty uh, around you, uh, to tell you the truth. But for me, what the question was like, uh, who, who any inspiration in your family or a role model or a strong uh, you know, woman character that you looked up to because you are working in gender space and helping adolescent women. So anything about that? I would say personally, if you ask me, I'm very uh, inspired by my mother, um, you know, mm. and I actually, in my journey in the work, I realized that mm. her journey was very inspirational to me, right? Uh, she got married when she was 17, had three kids by the age of 21, Mm -hmm. um, never got to complete her secondary education, but that never became a showstopper for her. Uh, she made sure that all three of us, I have an elder sister, uh, me and my younger brother, all three of us has the best education, continuously encouraged us. Uh, mm -hmm. We come from Uttar Pradesh, which has a very gender regressive social norms. But even in coming from there, mm -hmm. uh, she and my father both, I think they never discriminated between my, my elder sister and us. We all went to the best of the schools. We got the education, um, and rather I, I joke about it, but the reality is my sister is the one who's doing the best in terms of financially in the entire family. Uh, she's a software engineer now. So I think she's been a big inspiration to me. And I think, um, and in the journey of working with young girls, uh, I think I have met hundreds of them, you know, from a Rajkumari to a Rajni to a Pratibha to a Shweta, where you just kind of think about the fact that the amount of struggle that they are ready to pick up Mm. Uh, to move one step forward, right? So things that we take it for granted uh, and the struggle that they have to look. I think the you're right, like at some level, you one kind of gets desensitized when you look at so many things happening. But at the same time, it mm. is the stories of, uh, of resilience, uh, you know, driven by aspirations. Mm. You know, a girl who's ready to say, I'm going to bike 40 kilometers because that's where my college is. And so the job is to convince the parents to allow her to do that because she's ready to pick up that struggle. Mm. Uh, and I think when you look at those stories and look at the cost it comes to. Yes. Um, yeah. All the energy you need is there. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. You just need to, you know, give them a little bit of support, I'll say. Um, so, you know, uh, what I've seen is a lot of organizations are working in uh, in education space uh, in rural India. Uh, so what programs do you provide uh, that generally cater to adolescent girls? Because I think uh, generally when the girls do reach uh, at a certain age of maybe 12 or, or, or uh, you know, older, they kind of drop out because I think the dropout rates increase. So what do you provide? What programs do you provide through Milan uh, that can uh, help them? So, Namrita, we we also started as an education organization, the way yeah. I said, right? And yeah. I think the first seven, eight years of work, you know, building the school and then running centers for school dropout girls, hmm. uh, I think there was a point when we we were trying to really understand was how do, we, what is stopping people to send their daughters to school? So why are they not investing in mm. girls as they invest in boys, mm. right? Because there is only that much that you can do by giving a scholarship or giving books. Yeah. How do we really change that mindset? I think that is a very, very critical question that we started asking. Yeah. Uh, and I think one of the learnings that came from their entire conversations within the communities was the fact that, like, because of media, they think it's a good idea to educate your daughter, but they don't have a resemblance of saying what is going to happen, right? Yeah. Uh, mm -hmm. The idea that my daughter can get a job, you know, mm -hmm. is is a very far-fetched idea. 
specifically because the jobs they are looking at is only the government sector jobs which they are familiar with right mm. uh, so and 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 so we realized that if we are able to create mm. role models within the communities mm. that you know the the communities can look at and say if their daughter can do it then my daughter can do it the girls can look and say if she can do it then i can do it mm-hmm. uh, so then we started and we 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 designed a program which is called as the girl icon program okay. where we basically build these girl leaders within the communities and then every girl leader works with 20 more girls and these 21 girls do projects in their own community mm-hmm. uh, the core of the entire idea is to shift the mindset and we've seen that happening we've seen that with you know rajkumari in bulandshahar where i i myself remember when we had gone the you know the men will sit on a cot and the women will sit on the floor uh she uh i think she was the first girl who had gone to grade 8 uh yeah. okay. all her sister elder sisters were like fifth pass fourth pass mm-hmm. um and and you know when we started talking to the the father it was very interesting because a lot of people think that you know the parents don't want their daughters i think everybody wants good for their children it's mm-hmm. just that they are, you know the more vulnerable you are the more f- you you fear that much it's just mm-hmm. like you know what happens something happens if it goes to you know on the way something happens mm-hmm. uh, but when we start talking to the father and we were able to build the confidence he's like yeah that's okay you know i can't financially support it but i'll do whatever best i can we were able to get her admission into a residential college residential school which was run by this government um uh, and today she's the first graduate from her village wow. uh, mm-hmm. but the idea is not rajkumari graduation graduated which is one celebration but the fact is because one rajkumari went mm. for in her village it is not uncommon for girls to complete class 12 today right, right? Mm. and i think how do we really i know the the first one you know walks has to carry the torch um uh, mm. but it gives lights to many other way people who just follow and i think that is the mindset exponential kind of change that we are seeing in our world um uh, so in in the girl icon program over the last year last 8 years we've built a network of over 2500 girl icons uh across three states of uttar pradesh madhya pradesh and karnataka and uh, these works have these girls have collectively worked uh with over 100000 girls oh, wow so we are seeing exponential impact that is kind of mm. happening uh and then because we want them to succeed for us it's not just a programmatic intervention we continue to work with the girl icons you know in a life cycle kind of an approach so the girl icon the first batch of girl icon 2015 she's still with us uh oh. and now actually these girl icons are coming together and helping us scale the program because they are the coming together as like part time support staff mentors so it's an entire cycle uh that is coming together so in a nutshell we use comprehensive life skills programming uh you know mm-hmm. with a leadership framework which is basically me to we mm-hmm. and how do you start building confidence in girls that i can do it and then they start driving change mm-hmm. and in a combination of that we are building the movement of girl leaders uh mm-hmm. to challenge and change the gender regressive social norms and narratives and 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 rewrite them with stories of aspirations or with stories of love stories of hope and stories of energy Mm-hmm. uh and i think that's how maybe we change absolutely it's uh, yeah and uh, so you what i hear from you is just amazing and so you are creating an ecosystem uh, which is sustainable you know th- these girls are coming back it's not okay you know you provide them with something and go away and so it's it's uh, you know ongoing which is so wonderful and obviously you are doing uh, it hand in hand with the government also so we do work uh, yeah we do work with the government and i think yeah, because we we've yeah. also realized is that the government is the biggest service provider in the market right yeah. there's only that much that the philanthropic yeah. capital yeah. can do right hmm. uh, so be it coming to access to schools to access to education scholarships to even like we work with adolescent girls like menstruation become a big issue so access yeah. to sanitary napkins iron zinc tablet supplement so we work with the various networks hmm. so our idea is that the government has this network you know Hmm. the communities are there and the girls are there how do you connect all of them together yes. how do you fit into the synergy hmm. uh, together because the question we were asking was that just because there's a school doesn't guarantee that the girl goes to school yes but because there is a school it solves half the problem right ah. now you just have to work with the parents to make sure she comes to the school 
right? Yeah. Which is a very cost effective way of doing thing rather than just providing scholarships and building a school. We build a school. We know it's expensive. We run a school for 650 kids. So mm -hmm. I can give you a, um, a sense like, for example, in our school and generally in India, like to support one girl's or one child's education would be anything between 150 to 200 dollars uh, annually okay. uh, whereas in the girl icon program because of our scale we are able to support girls with as minimum as 45 dollars uh, you know for the entire program uh, which is an 18 months program but then in 18 months we are able to work with the family and the community to make sure that it's, she gets into a sustainable system and has access to services she requires mm. And like, you know, for me, what I understand is it's uh, as the girls get older, we, uh, you know, the parents or, uh, you know, their relatives has, uh, they have a fear of their safety also, you know, and they say, oh, we will not send it very far away from studying. So that's where, you know, there's so many, uh, you know, internal problems that uh, the girls can face. And you are trying to kind of, you know, lessen those uh, 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 basic needs and, you know, trying to build, uh, like you said, you've built a school closer in the areas where they don't have to travel uh, too far away. Uh, so there's small things. And, you know, I was just checking on your website, uh, listeners, you can go to milanfoundation.org and know what they are doing. Uh, their team uh, seems to be amazing. They have 67% women uh, in the board, 33% uh, minorities in the team, and 79% women uh, entirely in the team. And they have wonderful uh, partners uh, and ample media coverage. You were covered uh, by CNN and uh, Forbes, I heard. Uh, so, you know, uh, that shows that whatever you're doing is effective. And like you've said, you've help so many of uh, the girls there but what are the main challenges you face uh, doing this kind of a work especially working with young girls um i think our biggest challenge is on the both sides right one mm -hmm. is working with the communities and and second thing is working with donors um uh, because yeah. the work we are doing takes time mm -hmm. uh you're you know we are trying to change mindsets correct um, and just imagine for you and I also, right? For example, if I, um, you know, if I don't eat sushi, you come and tell me sushi is very good for health. It's going to take me time to first, I'm going to try it for a couple of time, then probably make it a habit. And then maybe I like it and maybe I'll change that habit, right? Um, and I think just our dressing sense, it takes time to change our habits. It's as simple as that. Really? And I think to, to then to work with the communities mm -hmm. and at the community level, I think, we have to be continuously there, continuously having those conversations, understanding the challenges they're facing, understanding mm -hmm. the core of those issues, mm -hmm. um, you know, and working with them. Uh, at the same time, you know, with the donors, like trying to really understand, it takes time. So it is, you know, um, it's not just about, and I think that those are systems that have to kind of come together. Right. Also, if you just look at Namrita, like I'm just going to just throw some very quick numbers, right? So less than 2% of the funding globally mm. goes to gender. Mm. Uh, in India, it's about only 0.4% or something. Mm. Now, the question is like, there is so much of discussion on a global thing around gender equality. Mm. Uh, you know, I think the World Economic Forum recently had said there's another 156 years we need to become a more gender equal world. Mm. Uh, but mm -hmm. that is only is going to change if you put the money where the mouth is, Absolutely. Uh, right? Yeah. And I think those are the things, and especially in the India's context, we are still home to the largest number of child brides in the world. Yes. Um, one yeah. in four girls become a child bride. 40% of our girls are still not completing secondary education. Mm -hmm. Gender-based violence is very at very high. But a core of all of this, right, the government as a system can only create services. Mm -hmm. They can build more school. They can build more thing. They can make a we have a child marriage law from last 20 years. True. We're still the home to largest number of child brides. But that's right. what the government can do. But what mindsets are very rare. That's the way right. we have to change. Yeah. <laughs> right. So, when we have a lot of people in the world, we have a lot of people in the world, we have a lot of people in the world, we have a lot of people in the world. And it, change is a slow process. It is a slow process, but, you know, at least like you're saying, one uh, role model can change, you know, so many lives. And I know time is running out. We have to talk about the upcoming gala where, uh, you know, uh, tell all about it. How can people join? How can they donate uh, and everything else? 
for sure so uh this is the first time we're doing an event uh, a fundraising gala in uh, in the bay area it's happening at the royal palace in fremont mm -hmm. it's on the 13th of october uh from 6 30 onward mm -hmm. uh please attend the event uh you know uh the tickets are available on our website if you can please consider donating your support will go a long way in supporting girls education and their well-being in india um we would love to see you there if you have any questions feel free to reach out to us uh yeah and we're looking forward to bringing you some very inspiring stories from india we also have a photo exhibition which is covered by christy smith who traveled to india and looked at our girl icon program we're bringing her photo exhibition to the event um so you'll meet some amazing people you will look at what we do learn more about us but please 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 do consider supporting mm -hmm. uh we're also building a community called as rice for her which is a monthly donation uh you know people who sign up for monthly donations so if you're interested as little as a 25 dollar or 30 dollar or 50 dollar all you can uh you can you can sign up on the website and please come to the event and be a part of it and help us do what we do best i guess absolutely so so listeners like uh, dhirendra has already uh, told you it's for such a good uh, cause to empower girls from vulnerable communities in india october 13th uh, 6 30 p.m to 10 p.m royal palace uh, in fremont so be there buy the tickets uh, on their website Milan uh, Foundation dot org or Milan uh, uh, has been uh, is a name which comes I think from Milan to co collectively do you know whatever you can and Elan Elan is a declaration that's what I read so it, it's such a beautiful name and uh, thank you Dharendra it's uh, been a very short talk we could you know have chatted for much longer because the work you all are doing is just very impactful and very uh, uh, you know inspiring i have to say they please do go to their website they have programs like he talked about girl icon program and then there was also unmukt program which is you know changing uh, narratives that perpetuate violence against young women and girls in public spaces in rural uttar pradesh so there's much more that you all are doing uh, so thank you for joining me today and i will definitely uh, see you i think october uh, 13th narendra Thank you so much, Namrata. And, you know, I really, really appreciate your unconditional support and giving us a shout out. It's people like you that gives us the energy and support for the work that we are doing on the ground. That's what I'm here for, you know, providing a platform to uh, you guys. And listeners, all I'll say is raising a feminist son is as important as raising a self-reliant daughter in uh, today's time. So, you know, uh, encourage the boys to get involved Uh with gender uh, equality uh, uh, you know issues i'll say so uh, thank you and uh, be well take care Shosha is a creative Indian restaurant located in the heart of Silicon Valley. Shosha is a woman-owned business that serves traditional Indian flavors assimilated with molecular gastronomy techniques. The best Indian bar with happy hours in the Bay Area serves handcrafted drinks inspired by flavors from India with modern craft cocktails that are presented in unique ways. Shosha is a modern take on traditional Indian cuisine. We specialize in corporate luncheon, anniversary celebrations, birthday parties, and catering. Do check us out for a memorable modern Indian dining experience. Shosha is located at 141 South Murphy Avenue in Sunnyvale, California.